Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he living or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to mix my bread. This is Carolina Haynes. Welcome, dear listener, to the Carolina Haynes Podcast, brought to you by Rick Abbott Productions. I'm your host, Dan Sellers. Giants. We've talked about them before, but not the ones from New York or the ones from San Francisco. Or even the jolly green ones. In season four, we talked about Judicola and the Nephilim, and the story about Judicola Rock that allegedly still bears his seven-fingered handprint. Everyone knows the story about David and Goliath. Goliath was said to be ten and a half feet tall and have three brothers of equal stature. But the first mention of giants in the Bible is at the very beginning. Genesis. There were giants in the earth in those days and afterward. And afterward. That's our story today. Because there have been tales of people as tall as Goliath, and even taller, all throughout history, and all over the world. And believe it or not, it's not as rare as you might think. But let's start in modern times. For the past 75 years, since we got the Guinness Book of World Records, only the people that they have measured themselves are counted in the discussion. In that regard, Robert Wadlow was the tallest person to ever live at 8 feet 11 inches. You may have seen some old footage of Robert. He had a condition called gigantism that made him grow extraordinarily large, but also racked his body with ailments and side effects. In the old footage, he struggled to walk even though he was only about 20 years old. He passed away at the young age of just 22. In fact, since Guinness came into the picture, everyone over 8 feet tall has suffered from gigantism and the bone and joint issues that come along with it. The tallest person they recorded that did not have these disorders was Angus McCaskill at 7 feet 9 inches. But, like I said, according to officials, only the past 75 years count. Robert Severe was a captain in the Revolutionary War and nearly as tall as Angus at 7 feet 6 inches. Robert came from Tennessee, and if you're thinking he came from Sevierville, then you're right but the town was named after his brother, General John Sevier, who later became governor of the state. Together, the Sevier brothers fought at the Battle of Kings Mountain in Cleveland County, North Carolina. The skirmish was widely considered to be one of the key turning points in the war. Thomas Jefferson described it as, The joyful annunciation of the turn of the tide of success which terminated the Revolutionary War with the sill of our independence. Toward the end of the battle, on October 7, 1780, Robert was shot in the kidney. The daughter was unable to remove the bullet and told the Severe brothers that it could get infected and lead to blood poisoning if Robert didn't stay in Kings Mountain and wait for further treatment. General Severe ordered for his brother to remain behind, but Robert feared the enemy would find him and take him captive. He would rather risk death. So, as soon as the army was out of sight, he mounted a horse and set out for home along with his nephew and a couple other companions. He was in so much pain that he could barely ride, but ride he did. Nine days into the journey, the group made camp in Mitchell County near the Tennessee border. Robert had been particularly weak that day and after dinner, he fell severely ill. As the doctor predicted, the wound had become infected and the giant Robert Severe passed away during the night. He was buried under a large mountain oak in the grave marked with stones. Robert's nephew later said that after he passed, 
his horse became difficult to deal with. The animal bucked and pulled continuously, trying to get back to its fallen owner. In 1951, the Daughters of the American Revolution placed a tombstone at the site where the massive tree once stood. And while Robert's grave was easy enough to locate, due to its immense size, locals claim that Sabir's spirit was no longer there. Locals tell of a road not too far from Sabir's grave where people claim to feel uneasy. People walking along the road at night say they can feel someone coming up behind them, but when they turn to look, no one's there. Occasionally, they also hear the click-clack of horse hooves, but again, no horse can be seen. The locals believe it's the spirit of Robert Sevier trying to make his way back home and his faithful steed trying to find him. In 1871, archaeologists excavated a Native American burial mound and found over 200 giant skeletons, all ranging from 7 to 9 feet tall. The mound was dated as being about 9,000 years old. The current whereabouts of the remains is unknown. Similarly, a few months later, a crew working on a railroad line demolished another Native American mound outside of Weldon, North Carolina, in Halifax County. Among the pottery and the arrowheads, they found the remains of nine-foot-tall bodies. It said that the bones of the skulls were an inch thick, and the teeth were filed to sharp points. Again, the current whereabouts are unknown. The next 50 years saw an explosion in the number of giant skeletons found from all over the world. South Africa, China, Ecuador, Greece, India, South America, Norway, and many more. In 1912, another mass grave of seven to nine foot tall skeletons was found in Wisconsin. The skulls were described as being elongated and having primate characteristics. Again, whereabouts unknown. Through the years, explorers in huge burial mounds of Illinois and Missouri have found numerous human, or human-like, remains. Skeletons up to 10 feet tall, their skulls elongated and found to hold double rows of teeth, one set behind the other. They also had six fingers and six toes. Oddly enough, these are fairly common traits found in gigantic remains. As you may recall, Judicola was said to have seven digits. Similar bodies have been found in Massachusetts, Vermont, New York, and Arkansas. When Abraham Lincoln gave a speech at Niagara Falls, he said, The eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours do now. Nevada history tells of a race of red-haired cannibalistic giants that lived in Lovelock Cave. They were eventually wiped out in the mid-1800s by a native tribe who were tired of being their dinner. They drove the giants into Lovelock Cave and then set fires to the entrances to suffocate them with smoke. The caves were excavated in the 1920s and 20,000 artifacts were discovered including moccasins that were 15 inches long. The layers of bat guano coating the cave allowed the relics to be dated from the mid-1800s all the way back to 2600 BC. They also found 40 burial pits in the cave, the dry desert air mummifying the remains. Most were between 8 and 10 feet long, but a few were as tall as 11 feet. Some even had tufts of red hair still attached to the skull cap. And, as you may have guessed, current whereabouts, still unknown. It's believed by medical physicians that 11 feet would be the maximum height for a bone structure of a human being to support. In current times, we see the deformities and maladies that accompany gigantism. And while conspiracists 
may point out that with characteristics like six fingers and double rows of teeth, the giants are not homo sapiens. But the physics still apply. The human bone structure just can't support an individual more than 11 feet tall. But we have stories of much, much taller examples. In 1577, a skeleton over 19 feet tall was found in Switzerland. In France, a skeleton 23 feet tall was found in 1456, 25 feet tall in 1516. And as far as back as the day of Christ, three skeletons were unearthed by an earthquake in Greece. They measured a whopping 36 feet in length. So, how do all these remains get lost? Well, maybe they don't. They get stolen. This is perhaps where the conspiracists hold the truth. The United States government, in particular the Smithsonian Institute. One way or another, every time the remains of a giant skeleton was unearthed, the Smithsonian found a way to acquire it. Eventually, they created their own division of mound hunters that would excavate and hide away the remains before anyone else could see them. But why would the Smithsonian care? Why suppress the history? Why destroy countless Native American artifacts? Basically rewriting the mound builder narrative. Conspiracists have two hypotheses. Some thought that since the Nephilim of the Bible were said to be giants, any proof of the existence of giants would, by extension, prove the Bible to also be true. But the most widely accepted reasoning was that they were, quote, protecting Darwin's theory of evolution and the established historical narrative at all costs. At least, that was what the American Institute of Alternative Archaeology claimed when they filed a lawsuit against the mighty Smithsonian. The lawyer claimed that there has been a major cover-up by Western archaeological institutions since the early 1900s to make us believe that America was first colonized by Asian peoples migrating through the Bering Strait 15,000 years ago, when in fact there are hundreds of thousands of burial mounds all over America which the natives claim were there a long time before them, and that show traces of highly developed civilization complex use of metal alloys and where giant human skeleton remains are frequently found but still go unreported in the media and news outlet. But making these claims are easy. As with any legal suit, it must be proven. Now, the AIAA may have an acronym like any other normal institute, but alternative archaeology? The organization didn't hold very much weight in the scientific community. So how in the world was this ragtag group of crackpots on a shoestring budget ever going to topple one of the most powerful scientific institutes in the world with unlimited resources at their disposal? Well, they hadn't planned on winning. They just wanted to raise awareness of the issue. However, unexpected evidence came to light from the 1930s. A high-level curator at the Smithsonian had taken a bone home with him. He hid it away all his life and passed it down to his kids when he died. With it, he wrote, quote, It is a terrible thing that has been done to the American people. We are hiding the truth about the forefathers of humanity, our ancestors, the giants who roamed the earth as recalled in the Bible and the ancient text around the world. Upon hearing about the lawsuit, his descendants saw an opportunity to honor his memory and turn the bone over to the AIAA. And what about the bone? It was a human femur bone. The length of a typical femur is about 18 inches. But the bone that was presented at trial against the Smithsonian was over 50 inches long. 
Ultimately, the Smithsonian admitted to destroying tens of thousands of giant skeletal remains, most ranging up to 12 feet in height. It seems clear that the government is determined to eradicate any evidence of giants from history. But the thing about history is that it still continues. Given the overwhelming accumulation of stories in the Smithsonian's own acknowledgments, it seems like it will just be a matter of time before the undisputed public evidence surfaces. To learn more about this story, check out North Carolina's Haunted 100, Volume 3, Haints of the Hills, by Daniel Barefoot. Check out Forgotten Tales of North Carolina, by Tom Painter and Roger Kammerer. There's also allthat'sinteresting.com, archaeology-world.com, Gaia.com, medium.com, and sciencetimes.com. This episode was researched and written by Jeffrey Cochran and was produced and hosted by me, Dan Sellers. Special thanks to Brett Clark for providing additional vocal talents to this episode. You can find everything about our production company at our website, RecapitProductions.com. You can find the Carolina Haynes podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Please leave us a review and share the show with a friend. This podcast is also brought to you by Carolina Haynes Incorporated, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting folklore storytelling throughout the Carolinas. You can help us on our mission by joining our team on Patreon. With monthly contributions of $5, 10 or $25, you can receive perks such as the Carolina Haints Map of Monsters and Legends, behind-the-scenes video series, and monthly mini-episodes that are exclusive for members. Just visit patreon.com slash Carolina Haints to learn more. You can find everything about us, including the Carolina Haints book, Legends and Lore Markers, and tour dates for upcoming appearances on our website, carolinahaints.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, simply at Carolina Haints. And feel free to contact us directly at carolinahaints at gmail.com. We'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. Tune in then to hear more about those things that go bump in the night.